Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am your humble reviewer, Ray, and uh, today I will be reviewing uh, several classic and more up-to-date books uh, on the audio style uh, for you. Uh, just just as an uh, update on what's going on, I posted a little while back about my mother. She did have a heart attack, um, and we did go back to see her. She's had half of her surgeries done as she needed to. I don't know why they did it this way. Um, I guess she had a really bad occlusion and they could not do the stents the way they needed to. So they stented up some other vessels that were also clogged. And uh, either, I I know today they gave her uh, her new surgery date. I don't know when that will be because my father is too lazy to get on the phone to talk to his son. So I will find out and I'll let you all know, Um, but she is recovering. She actually sounds better today than she probably has in about 10 years. Uh, When my mother talked, she usually talked like this. And uh, today I talked to her on the phone for about 20 minutes and she was actually very much more vivacious. Uh, and alert than I've seen or heard her in a long time. Uh, so that was very nice, and I was very happy to see she's getting well so long. So anyway, thank you for, for asking about that. Uh, now, if I can, if I'm allowed, <laughs> uh, we will begin the show. Get ready, get set, crazy cats and chicks, here we go. All right, next up is Monster's Mercy by William D. Arand. This is one of those Arandverse books. Uh, narrated by the ever-amazing Andrea Parsnow, with a book length of 14 hours and 36 minutes. Candles dotted the walls and gave the room a creepy, old-timey feel. Then René was free to move, at which point he promptly fell flat on his face and died. René's eyes opened unto a world of darkness, Stretching out in every direction, there was nothing. In fact, René had no eyes. When he tried to inspect himself, he found he was nothing. No feet, torso, hands, nothing. Case in point, he felt nothing. Not even the monster behind his eyes. Laughter rang throughout the void. Roaring, guffawing laughter. (laughs) <laughs> now, that was absolutely hilarious. <laughs> so he, here's a book that kind of blends elements of Dexter uh, with his dark passenger premise and a hint of elements from Fostering Faust with the alignment bar parallel, as well as bits of the Green Hornet. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Rand is kind of... Uh, picking and choosing bits and pieces of different stuff and mushing them all together into a really great story. Um, I really respect that. Um, a Green Hornet is, is a story where a, a good guy takes on the persona of an underworld boss to get control of the criminal activity in his city. So he, he pretends to be a criminal in order to control criminals. Um, and personally, I like the concept a lot here. I like the banter between the MC and his monster, so to speak. Um, this iteration of the Iranverse focuses on Rene, uh, a contract killer who is from our world. I keep using this stuff. One, because, um, you know, he, of course, he's not in our world. He's stuck in a computer program, doesn't know it. Um, who is then killed, this, this Rene is killed, and then offered a new lease on life so long as he can keep his alignment meter filled to the brim of goodness. In other words, he's got a, a little stick here, and as long as it's topped off up in blue and it's all positive, he's okay. Uh, the minute it goes down, his okay he goes into the toilet. Flush. Um, it, it's bad, because he, he will not only die, but he's going to have an eternity of torment. Um, and so, uh, basically, basically, bad stuff happens if he gets full-blown evil. The problem is, is that Rene has this dark passenger uh, who has driven him to kill his whole life. Um, now, this alternate personality likes to speak in rhymes, and it's very much, and it's kind of like um, if you've ever read DC's uh, The Demon, Etrigan, with Jason Blood. It reminded me a lot of that because, you know, Etrigan is like this evil id type character, like it's housed inside of Jason Blood. Um, and, you know, gone, gone, form of man arise, the demon Etrigan. Um, that's the, the 
the phrase to release the demon. And, and Etrigan is a rhymer. Uh, and in hell, rhyming is a sign of status. You know, if you're a rhymer, you, you do that as evidence of your, your greatness. And so he's very proud of his ability to rhyme and his, his capability of doing so. Um, and so this monster, they have a nice little backstory about like why the monster rhymes and I think even why the monster exists. Like if you watch Dexter, uh, Dexter becomes a serial killer, which uh, they, they contradict themselves because anyway, he's, he's left in this, this uh, shipping crate uh, after his mother's been chainsawed and there's blood everywhere. Um, and so, you know, after he watched his mother die, they left him locked up for a while in this, this super hot shipping crate um, before he's rescued. And so uh, that caused him to become a sociopath. This is Dexter now. Um, and so something very similar like that happens to Rene. Uh, all they kind of do is live, you, you know, Rene gives you little clues and hints as to what might have happened. But he doesn't really come right out and say, here is the deal. But the best part about it is, is he gets put into a new world. He, he's given this new lease on life. He's reborn into a world with some magic, elves, and I'm sure other fantastical creatures and possibilities. Um, but he retains all of his knowledge of his former life uh, when he's reborn. And he grows up, this time, in a loving household without the monster in his head. It's silent. Uh, and the deal is, is he can get all his assassin skills back if his life is ever in danger. So he, he kind of grows up um, into a teen and he's about ready to go off to college, so to speak, in this other world. Um, and, and Rene is totally great with his family, he loves his dad, loves his sister, loves his mother, um, and he loves the silence in his head. Well, he is uh, kind of like, you know, he, he's kidnapped. Um, and so all that uh, that comes back to him in a rush, you know, uh, along with uh, something else, a, a gaming menu. Yes, he gets a gaming menu on top of a lot of skills and ability that lets him just kind of pick up new skills quickly and makes him tougher to kill. And best of all, the monster returns with the, this whole package. So now Rene must balance to keep his um, need because the monster really made him need to kill his need to keep from sinning um, to the needs of his city and his monster. Now, the monster is a little bit changed here from the, the initial time that you meet the monster, uh, but it's not perfect, and it does have uh, a lot of the same issues as it started out with in, in the original world that uh, Rene came from. So, you know, it's a nice thing to, to, to see this cognitive dissonance, and I'll get into all that here in a little bit, but um, the, the issue is, is Rene becomes enmeshed in the goings-on of this new city uh, after he breaks free of his captors, and that's as far as spoiling it as I'm going to get. Um, naturally, he becomes involved in a, well, this is, this is a rant, so you know it's going to be like a nice soft corn love triangle slash um, harem to start off with. Uh, but he's involved in a love pentagon between himself and four other women. Um, now I have to say, I, I find it hard uh, to believe that an amoral murderer who was on the path to redemption wouldn't partake in some of the ladies' wares. Um, even some of the high-class call girls that were set aside just for Renee on his request, um, you know, to just... Not using them makes it a little bit less than believable, especially when the monster's in his head screaming all the time how he wants to get some. Uh, you know, and I'm not talking peaches and apples and cobblers. Uh, the, the, the monster in his head wants some, some lady stuff. Um, and, you know, it's not like he didn't use prostitutes in his former life. So it makes no sense to me that, you know, he would kind of sly style. Just, Sly away. I don't, know. I don't even know what I'm trying to say now. It makes sense that he would kind of uh, slip away um, from that if he if he was afraid of a certain like disease or something like that. But he's not, and he knows that these people that have been set aside for him are totally clean, 100%. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, at some point those three girls that are, are in there will also become a part of the harem. So we'll, we'll see. Um, but it's just less than believable that he doesn't go out and just ravage 
somebody. Um, and and Tina you know, looked at it through a lens, okay, um, that Renee had never really had, like, this real relationship in his old life. He never knew how to actually have uh, a relationship or to love someone or, or to be loved by somebody. So once I look at it like that, I can say, well, I can understand why he didn't do that because he wants a real relationship. He doesn't know who he wants it with, whether it's with the cat girl, the elf, uh, the, the rich chick, uh, or the three prostitutes. Um, you, you know, he doesn't really know who he wants to to claim, um, and and a lot of mechanicians uh, later he finds himself struggling to kind of hold them at bay uh, because they are moving in on him um, rapidly. Um, so yeah, and, and also he's he's an adult in a teen body. So you know, I didn't take that into consideration, but he's an adult in a teen body that didn't make him less socially awkward. However, if he had never had a, a relationship in his previous life, I can say I could see see him having a, a, a time with it. So I, I can cut William Moran a little bit of a break here. Anyway, uh, I do want to say that I, I, even though I enjoyed this tale, it pinched elements from other Rand novels. Um, and it didn't really pull the trigger on the harem aspect in any way that I would have thought it would have. I did, like, not like I expected. Um, and that's very nice. Um, it's a nice addition to the overarching storyline that Rand is building towards. But it also says, like, you know, we're not going to have the guy, like, hitting 15 ladies. Uh, and I don't mean, like, punching them out. I mean, like, he's he's hitting that stuff. Um, you know, in the first 10 pages of the book. Uh, you know, and he's not, not got... 14 or 15 girls with him, uh, you know, that are just in love. He's got f three, four, and uh, he's, he struggles to balance all of them, okay? Um, now, what I need to say is, is we get to the gold. This is where we get to the gold. Andrea really outdoes herself here. I mean, she gives herself distinctive voices to Renee, the monster, the hood, the mask. They're all the same people, by the way. Yeah. Um, Renee, the monster, the hood, the mask, they're all the same person. They all get a different voice or a different accent because Renee is playing a part. Um, and one part I particularly enjoyed was how she used the Watchers, um, I wonder who that could be, um, voice to add some flavor to explanations in details on items that were scanned so you know she she would she would actually play as if she were the watcher which is uh, i guess you're going, to, you're going to say it's runner um who's there and, and she'll be like well uh what is the damage on the sword so it's a sword long sword that the damage mm, i want to say eight to 16 points of damage so you know that's runner just guessing what it's going to do and then making it happen. So it was pretty slick. Um, and finally, I really applaud her addition of the bloopers and outtakes at the end of the story. Uh, that, for me, was some of the best stuff in the world. And it just goes to show me that you can have a full and happy career narrating in spite of suffering from Tourette's Syndrome. Because that's all I can think of, and that's the only explanation I have uh, for what was said and what was done is Andrea, you have Tourette's. You need to see a doctor uh, <laughs> because because whatever's going on in that mind of yours, it, it needs help. Uh, no, I'm serious. It, it was it was really funny. The bloopers were were, were great. I, I think um, the first time I ever well, actually the first time I laughed uh, from bloopers was Justin Thomas James, um, and he was he was doing Domino Finn's um, Afterlife stuff. And I was laughing so freaking hard. I almost crashed. I almost crashed. Thankfully, I was literally pulling into my garage, and I stopped to listen to the, the bloopers, because if I'd been listening to it, I probably would have hit something, um, just because it was it, it was that funny. It was, and I was just like, oh, my God, I, I can't believe she's saying these things and doing these things, and, and how is she doing both at the same time? I don't know. Uh, so final score is 8.3 stars. I really, really enjoyed this tale. All right. Uh, next book up is Alexa Dre, The Veils of Lemurel, uh, Bracador, book two, by Ember Lane. Uh, it's narrated by Stephanie Dillard. Uh, this is the second book in the series of Bracador. 
Um, and it has a book length of nine hours and 32 minutes. Wait, I shouted after him. Aren't you going to tell me how to play? I've no idea. He turned just by the door. It was then I noticed his piercing green eyes. That's hardly my fault. No doubt the AI has fathomed a way to ease you in gently. Gently? He shrugged. Probably won't overload you with attributes and stats to start. They can be quite daunting if you don't know what they do. He smiled. Computers, AIs, they can be quite clever, whatever you think. And this one is programmed to at least try and keep you sane. He winked at me. Maybe it'll give you an experienced guide or two. Now strip off and get in. It's either that or a very boring couple of dozen years. He left without another word. Okay, so I have to admit, I haven't read book one yet. Uh, but my understanding is that this, this is a, a book that is only tied to the first one by setting alone. Uh, book one has a completely different MC, uh, whereas the setting remains the same. I can't speak for the quality of book one, but if it's like this one, it has to be pretty darn good. Now, to be honest, the premise is fairly simple. Um, Earth is ravaged, and mankind's only hope is to go to the stars to live somewhere else. Hopefully somewhere nice, uh, you know, like Aruba or Jamaica. Ooh, I wanna take you. Um, anyway, naturally, interstellar travel time is extensive. It takes a long time to go from one place to another without having, like, you know, a wormhole. Um, and no one wants to end up like the people in Wall E, i.e., they uh, grow to fit their chairs. Uh, so if they place their minds into this video game world to occupy themselves as they soar through the, the realm of space. Now, the MC has never been a gamer, and so this, this whole process is a little unnerving for them at first. Uh, the MC, Alexa Dre, finds herself in a fantasy world full of wizards and warriors, and the only thing that she really has going for her is her tenacity. Um, she just doesn't give up, which is good because she sort of stumbles into an area that she just is not ready for as a player. Um, but one of the, the nice, unique things is, well, or anyway, different, anyhow, is that even though this is a fantasy setting, the book does not really emphasize or necessitate the need for battle. And that is what is good about this book. It focuses on world building, it is chock full of interesting legends, traditions, and folklore. Um, Alexa has companions who have no problem uh, letting her fall flat on her face, and at times don't even seem quite as helpful as they should be, but she carries on. Um, if, in fact, Alexa is supposed to have this um, untapped magical potential that could lead to greatness, but she has a hard time getting anybody to even being willing to teach her how to apply those skills or to get the basics down. Um, so, you know, it's kind of it's kind of rough on, on her. Um, Stephanie Dillard, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going too quick now because I'm really tired. It's really late. But I want to make sure I, I at least am fair about everything. Um, I, I don't want to rush through this. Um, but Stephanie Dillard does an amazing job here and does so very well that she is at once very familiar to me and yet, also is a refreshing change. As I mentioned in another review where the narrator did not fit the story kind of thing, Dillard has no such difficulties. There are times where she reminded me of Andrea Parsnow, um, having such an eclectic set of vocal tools to choose from. Um, she really brought this book to life, and I think that she elevated the story all the way around, too. Um, she had a complete command from beginning to end, and was an utter pleasure to listen to. She has a wonderful range of characters, male and female, and knows how to base a story. So when you, you listen to uh, uh, Sarah, I'm sorry, Stephanie, Stephanie Dillard talk, um, you don't know basically how that word is. You, you don't know, well, you, you know who's talking, but you don't know where that voice comes from within her uh, because it, they are very well thought out, but it, you, they also seem very spontaneous. Um, you know, I think that she she knows the characters and she said, okay, this is how 
well, I'll just say like Butch Cassidy. At this, you know, he, this is how he sounds. He he walks like this. He talks like this. So she has a rhythm and a pace for his his speech, and she knows how to to talk like him. Um, but where that comes from, I just I I don't know. She does a really good job here. Um, again, I can't speak for book one, and I'm trying to keep this short because I'm really struggling to stay awake now. It's getting really late, um, and I hate to, to shorten this up, but I really liked the story. Um, and you know, like I said, I can't speak for book one, but the story is well-crafted, and it's expertly narrated. Um, I'm going to give it 7.9 stars. It, it wasn't quite as perfect as I'd hoped, um, but it's it's pretty darn close. I really enjoyed this book, and I really liked Dillard's performance immensely. Uh, she just kills it. So, you know, if you're, you, if I were anybody else out there, I would watch, uh, because this is another one of those people that you're going to say she's up and coming, and she's just going to blow you out of the water uh, as soon as she has an opportunity. So keep an eye out for her. Keep an ear open and pick her stuff up, because she is a great narrator. And, and the story is really good, too. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that. You know, like I said, I didn't read book one. Um, it's been a long time out, but, but Ember Lane does a really great job telling this tale. Um, and I just think that now, having listened, I want to go back and see what happens in book one. But Stephanie doesn't have anything to do with it. So it would probably be weird for me to go back and listen to a story that the, the, the narrator for book two wasn't a part of. I like consistency with stuff. So anyway, uh, that that was the score. Uh, it is a solid 7.9 stars. I think you'll like the book, so check it out. A book that I, I, okay, I'll get I'll get into this. Um, it's Core of Fear, a paranormal lit RPG dungeon core spirit core story uh, by Jonathan Brooks, narrated by Sarah L. Colton. Uh, which is part of the Spirit Core series, book one. Um, and this has a book length of seven hours and three minutes. Hey, what gives? I was enjoying that. I know. That's why I stopped it. A voice interrupted his complaint. This is hell, Clive, not a day spa. You're supposed to be burning in the fires of hell for all eternity for your sins, which, congratulations, you have a lot of. Not enjoying every minute of it. He couldn't see who was speaking to him, as he was back in the formless expanse that he had first experienced when he had died. It wasn't all enjoyable. It was quite boring after a while. See, that's what I'm talking about. Anyone else that had experienced what you did would have lost their sanity and screamed incoherently for eternity. But you got bored. I know that you felt the pain, but you enjoyed it more than anything, the voice said. As what was now obviously a female spoke, a figure started to materialize in front of his. All right, so so here's the deal, okay? Um, this one is really hard for me to review, and I've kept this on the back burner for some time. And I think I've talked about it probably two or three times on uh, other shows as I did other reviews. I'd say, well, I'll be talking about Core of Fear or something like that, and I, I really wanted to, Um because I really love Brooks' stuff. A lot of his stuff is fantastic. Hell, he's one of the most prolific writers in the dungeon genre. And he has a lot of great books to back him up. And that is the problem here. Um, he has great books. Okay, Books are easy to love or hate based on the writing alone. But when that book becomes an audiobook, it gets an additional element that can elevate or break the tale. The narrator. Now, first off... I want to say to Jonathan, props, dude, for doing a horror book. Uh, I am 100% in, in all the way uh, for a horror novel, uh, for a little RPG. No, we don't have enough. We, we need it. It is, it is a, a desperately needed part of the genre. Um, we have a few out there. Angel Ramon writes his, his zombie stuff. Um, but, but overall, you don't see a lot of nightmarish, horror, scary stuff in this genre, like Matt Denneman really just killed the other day um, with the, the the kaiju surgeon uh, book. But to me, that wasn't horror. Um, it was more of a, a gross splatter punk kind of thing. Uh, with, with you know, it was it was about body horror, if anything. 
Uh, and, and of course, it, it, it's easy to say that, but it wasn't like a, a scary, scary, we have elements, even though it had elements of serial killers and that sort of thing in it. Um, it, it really, it, to me, it's not a horror novel. It's a splatter punk or a gore novel. Um, but I would still call it horror. I'll, I'll keep it in that category just because we, we need that. Um, so props, dude, for doing this. It's just one of those things. Horror is one of these things that are great for movie studios because they can kind of crank out you know, a silly premise for a few million dollars and make huge money off of it. It is rare to see big budget horror movies, though. Horror movies are a B movie. It, horror is just a B movie dweller 90% of the time. If you're lucky, it's a B movie horror um, you know, dweller. Uh, it, most of the times, it doesn't even get to that that point. I mean, it's just weak sauce, and I'm I'm, I'm not happy with the state of affairs in horror at the moment uh, because some of the stuff to me is just stupid. Everybody talks about how great The Conjuring is, and I, I, I probably fell asleep on The Conjuring three times on three different occasions before I finally made it all the way through the movie. That's how bored it, it made me. It totally just made me want to fall asleep. And the second one, I, I won't even mention it, okay? Um... Yeah, I have high horror standards, and, and I grew up in the hack slash, so I can say, look, I've seen the trash, and I've seen the classics. Um, and, and so, you know, it, this is one of those things where I take it very seriously. And, and Brooks is Brooks is a true master of his craft. Uh, he seems to understand this genre that I love so deeply. Uh, and he weaves a very, very complex tale uh, that stars an MC who isn't all that nice. If you want to be honest about it, he's a psycho that escaped from hell and returns to Earth to send innocent people into the abyss. So he's a real a-hole. Okay, just to be nice about it, he's he's not the greatest cat in the in the, the you know the orphanage there. Um, he, he's a pretty rotten shamil. Now the premise of the book itself is, I mean, it's it's just dark and it is unrelenting. Um, and in my opinion, it's pretty freaking fearless. Uh, the book, it, it's unremorseful, unforgiving. And I've said unrelenting, but I'll say it's unrelenting. The game mechanics, as always with Brooks, work really well. And they're a neat little addition to what could be just a horror novel unto itself. I mean, if Brooks really wanted to, he could have just made this a horror novel instead of a dungeon core story or a horror lit RPG, uh, but he didn't. And, and I was actually... Lori was actually writing a horror core story myself until I listened to this book. And I stopped because they were just they were just so similar in some of the ideas. Uh, so I just tossed it out the window. Um, and, and if you, you I have a book coming out at some point in the future, you'll see the, the beginnings of that horror core. Uh, and I, I had to change it because I, I didn't want to compete with Brooks. So um you, you'll see, though, that I did did do that, so uh, it was kind of too similar. So you can see that my taste and Master Brooks are not dissimilar to one another. And the book did remind me of the movie Shocker in just a little bit, in which a serial killer is executed, but then comes back as an undead boogeyman and goes around and you know, he starts whacking people. It, it did have a, a bit of that in, in, in mind, because, you know, the, but anyway, the hard part here for me... And it, it, it totally kills me to do this. It, the hard part here is that the narration, and I mean no disrespect to Miss Colton, none, um, but it, the narration does not fit the tone of this novel. Her voice, and I'm just speculating here, uh, all the way down the line, it, it is very suited towards, you know, maybe romances or young adult novels, um, a, a place in which I'm sure she would absolutely kill. Absolutely, I have no doubt that... Um, romance, YA stuff would be like her forte. I mean, she would just nail it, own those books, and just run away with piles of money. Uh, I'm sure she would kill, no pun intended. But it just does not suit this novel at all. And I mean, not at all. Um, if I am frank about this, it was like listening to a middle schooler trying to tell me you know, trying to read to me Stephen King's The Stand. Yeah, yeah. She did an okay job in Dungeon Player, and I mean okay. 
Um, I, I wasn't rocked off with my socks off, but I, I think she did okay. I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Uh, but this story is not, and I mean it is utterly not even close um, to being, you know, you know, a part of her style, her storytelling technique. Um, it just doesn't fit. Like none of it kind of fits the way that you would want it to um, for her because she she just doesn't have that kind of a voice that instills fear. I mean, it's not her a dig at her being a female. I can tell you right now, Annalise Rene, um, Sarah Sampino, uh, of course, Andrea Parsonneau, uh I can I can name a lot of of different uh, narrators. Annie Ellicott, Mary, you know. Mary Catherine Winkle, um, Mary Catherine, oh my god, anyway, you get the idea, it has nothing to do with her being a female, it just that her voice does not fit this book at all to me, I mean, to me, um, it, like I say, it's, it's like a, a, a small child trying to read something really dramatically, and, and it just doesn't play. You know, like I can have my, my six-year-old read War and Peace out loud, and it, even if it did so fluently, it just would not have the gravitas or the impact that it would if it was read by an adult. And again, I'm not comparing her to saying she's childish or, or, or anything at all. I'm just saying her voice just does not match what is needed here. I wouldn't have a six-year-old, no matter how fluent or how well that well spoken they were, read War and Peace and hear... Her style of reading is not equipped to do this horror. At no point, like, did I feel tension or? And I know, and I kept saying to myself, if it was anybody else reading this, whether it was a man or a woman, whatever, I would have more tension. I would have more concern. Uh, I, I would feel more at, um, ill at ease. Something, um, or I, I would be more into it. Like I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, he's going to get get him. Or, or something along those lines, and it didn't, it didn't do that with me. And it's not the writing, because I liked what was said, I just didn't like the way it was being said. And again, she is not a bad narrator. Um, but this is one of those things where I say, you've got to kind of match up um, exactly what your story is with who's going to be the one telling it. And, you know, I, I don't think I would have you know, uh, somebody who, who um, the, like, like German, uh, play a Frenchman and expect me to believe that he's French. You know, it, it just wouldn't fly. And it's the same thing here. I just don't buy uh, her her style or her, her performance as much as I, I wish I should. Um, so I have to give this like seven stars. And I, and I really thought about this for a while. The story is amazing. I love the story uh, all the way down the line. Uh, and the narration is okay. It just does not match what I needed for this book. There's a lot of ways you could have went. Um, I would even have said, you know, Miles, you know, from the Dungeon Co Core World, the Dungeon World books, uh, as much as I would rather he'd have done it, I don't think he would have fit the story either. Um, so, you know, sometimes this is where I just say I wish there was a little bit more thought put into who's reading what when people do things because yeah i am audio i'm 100 percent audio book i don't read books as much as i wish i could i don't have time i literally have no time to read um i struggle to find time to record this or to even write a review or do my own writing for other things i i, I am very limited on when i can do things and so you know matching that up is very essential I love the story, but the narration just did not carry the gravity of this book, not, not like it needed to. And again, Miss Colden is is an excellent reader. She's an excellent narrator. Um, and it, it is not a dig against her, but her voice just does not fit. Um, yeah, it, let, me, let, let me just give you an example. Um, and, and I'm not making a light of her speaking ability or her, the way that her voice sounds. But if I was reading Dracula and and, and you know... Dracula came out and he was like, So, now I will drink your blood. And as I do that, you will drink mine. And after that, you will rise up and become one of my brides. You would not in any way be intimidated by that story. You just wouldn't because it just does not fit the tone, the feel, 
the ambience of the story. And, and again, I'm not saying that's how she sounds to me. I'm just saying that there's a disconnect between her, her, her storytelling and the tale that's being told. Dungeon Player, not a bad bad move. I, I don't know if I, I'm 100% in love with it, but but here it, it is just a, it is off for me. And I really struggle to come up with that seven stars because for me, it's a really great book, really great. And then on the other hand, I, I struggled with the listening. And, and I hate when I have uh, have a point where I struggle listening to things. Um, and and I, I, like I said, I've had this done for a long time. I had it done for a long time. And I went back and I, I looked. I said, it can't just be me. And apparently it is because um, I don't think anybody said anything out of line where they were like, oh, I can't believe this, this person is doing the narration or whatever. Um, but I didn't hear anybody say, oh, man, a perfect fit. Um, and I could be wrong. I don't, I don't really read reviews very often. Um, I try not to bias myself, but like I said, I went back and looked well after I had listened to this and, and after I had thought about everything and, and had this down. And I've just been holding off on this just because I want to be really fair. And again, I, I'm almost afraid to do this because I don't want to be you know, a jerk when it comes to a review. But I have to be honest. I have to, I have to be honest here. Um, I, I don't want to ever lie to my audience or to the people that read reviews or listen to these um, because if I can't be honest with you in every aspect of it, every single time, if I can't be, be really 100% blunt, then there's no point to doing this. There's none. Um, and so I, I weighed a lot of stuff and I said, what, what would be my score for the book and what would be my score for the narrator? Start at 10, take out the difference, and, and where do you go? And so, you know, that's that's pretty much what I do for every story. Um, but here I had to really juggle it because I usually know right off the bat, like this is an eight-point book or it's it's just a little bit off. It could be right there. And this is one of those books where, for me, like a 7.6 or 7.5 or 7.4 or whatever, that's where the book is, is good. And there are just a, a couple technical things that kind of held me off on being perfect or getting a, getting into a really good way or maybe the there was just a little bit of something off in the writing it, it will improve with time um so you know like you say the story is really great so i have to be fair about it so seven stars and i'm sorry jonathan and I, i'm sorry miss you know miss colton but uh, uh I, I just just hate to do this to you and again sarah i, I apologize um because it is not a reflection on your ability. It just it just did not fit the way I think it should have. Written by Charles Dean, narrated by Jeff Hayes and Annie Ellicott. Uh, and this is the fifth book in the Return of series, and, and it has a book length of 11 hours and 8 minutes, but it, it doesn't feel like it's that long at all. I've been thinking about how nice it would be to take a vacation. The Herald said, Maybe the two of us could take the kids and go check out some of the villages by the river. I believe your assertion was correct, Jade. She definitely seems unstable. But still dangerous, Lee warned, cautioning the others against going any closer by raising his arm. I think, maybe. The Herald paused her faux farming. I could even go shopping and pick out a new dress. She said with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. Would you like that? Would you like to see me in a new dress? I don't know if it's right to kill this one. Jade frowned. She doesn't seem evil or anything. She doesn't even seem like a threat. Maybe we should just... Maybe we should just focus on helping her kill the enemy army instead and get out of here. Lee didn't even know how that would be possible. Without the use of a wish page, he had no confidence in killing thousands of soldiers by himself. Yet, as he stared at this broken shell of a woman, he actually agreed with Jade. <laughs> you know, when I first started thinking about doing this particular segment, and I, I've been wanting to get to it for a long time, um, because this is one of my favorite series, uh, I've just loved it from start to finish, uh, I really wanted to have a big pitcher of, of beer and just chug it down and go, one for Miller, you know, me, <laughs> And, and and I just did not do that because the book is fantastic, but it ends on a somber note. And for me to kind of make light of what happens in the book and the way things happen at the end wouldn't be appropriate. Um, 
the, the book itself is a very succinct and complete wrap up of the series, and it does it in a fantastic way. But let me let me get get into this, okay? So here, here's the point: we, we've come to the end of the road. Lee Lee and company have finally closed up shop after five fabulous books, and, and all I can say is it's been a heck of a ride. Uh, and the closeout's well worth it. I mean, the story is the ending is bittersweet, but it has a rather realistic view of of what it means to compete to become a god. And and by that I mean, you know, Lee has he started out one way and if if you can't see the character arch in the series, I mean, you you just you you'll never see it. Uh because Lee definitely goes through this massive change uh from who he was at the beginning of the books to the end of this book itself. Uh he just notoriously and amazingly and realistically it is portrayed uh, how a mortal man would deal with becoming a, an immortal god, you know, an all-powerful being. Uh, and and it, like I said, I'm not saying it's Lee, okay? Um, but but that was his his whole quest. He's got this whole thing. How does he deal with it? Because um, I can't tell you who wins the game. I don't want to do that. But but for Lee, he has this arc, and you know, he goes through being a simple person to trying to be the last herald and his arc of growth and change uh, is just impressive and again i don't want to say whether he gets to the immortality somebody does i'll say that somebody does get there uh you may be surprised you may not be uh maybe exactly what you're expecting you may say hey i saw charles doing this from a mile away uh but either way the growth of lee from the beginning to the end of the series is incredible and the lack of growth for miller is just as spectacular because miller never really changes miller is one of those guys and that's a great thing about side characters miller and dave they you know they don't shift who they are they are they are frozen points in time they, they stay the same you know they may do something a little bit differently here or there but but dave is always a lech and Miller is always a drunk who is violent. You know, he's an abusive alcoholic, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, but but uh, they don't really change very much. They, they stay the same. Uh, the only one I can say that really, really, really has an issue is, is Jade. She kind of has an arc, too, where she goes from being this crazy chick to being a lot more uh, down-to-earth and, and focused and somber uh, towards the end of the book. Uh, again... It's that growth of I'm a herald and you know I'm a human I'm a herald I'm becoming a god uh, kind of growth uh, that you see with Lee and you know she 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 tones down a lot from the first few appearances uh, she she definitely has an arc too uh, and, and you, just like I say you, you see how well Charles knows his characters and and how well they they are mapped out. Um, but anyway, Lee and his companions are forced to accelerate their plans when this villainous uh, Red Ramen, yum, Red Robin, no, Robin, Ramen, Red Ramen, Red Ramen, yum, there you go. Uh, he's like the lord of the spicy chicken noodles or something along those lines. Uh, begins eliminating uh, all these heralds at, one, at a pace. It's just, it's crazy. It makes Lee look like he's been napping for the last four books. Um, on top of that, Augustus' favorite herald, that's Lee, um, has to contend with other heralds as well as Red Ramen and figure out a way to keep his party alive in spite of being separated by vast difference, uh, distances, not differences. There are differences, but it's vast distances. Okay. And the book focuses on interpersonal relationships between Lee and his entourage, but it does not skimp out on the violence and the bloodshed. No, 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 no. Uh, that's one thing Dean is really good for, uh, bloody battles and swordplay. Miller and Dave have a really nice sequence, uh, and, and the shrine to Lee bit uh, made me guffaw. Like, just you just don't know how, how hard I laughed as Miller extolled the virtues of Augustus and his son, and, they, you know, they, he, he built a little altar with chicken and, and stuff like that, you know, fried chicken uh, to to curry favor. Uh, honestly, Miller just made this series for me. I, you have to say, you know, you know of all the, the characters out there that I've read, 
Miller is by far one of my all-time favorites. I mean, you, you got like Raceland, Tasselhop, Burfoot. There's Miller. Um, I'm just saying like those first two, they're, they're my all-time favorite characters. Um, and and they're not main leads, uh, even in, in their own books, like when, when Raceland is with Caramon. It's really Caramon's arc that supersedes the whole story. Uh, and Taz is just along for the ride. Uh, Raceland is just the, the villain. And so Caramon is the main the main lead in that Dragonlance novel series. Um, so that makes Raceland and Taz like secondary characters. And they don't change. I mean, like it, Raceland does at the end, but Taz is Taz 100%. He's just a the same from the beginning of the books until the very end of his life. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about Miller is he's immutable. He is immutable, unchangeable, unbending, unflexing, and, you know, he is who he is. Uh, so, you know, let's just face it, like, side characters are always better than Lee. It's just, just always. Um, you know, Miller's over-the-top insanity and devotion to Lee just made him one of my favorite characters. Um, one thing I will say... Um, without giving anything away, is that Dean does an excellent job, like I said before, showing how um, a mortal can go from being extremely attached to the people that, you know, they oversee and they work with every day and they interact with, to being pretty much apathetic and uncaring about the same mortals, maybe not the exact same mortals, but the same mortals of that world, uh, as they become more powerful and uh, ultimately more divine. Uh, divinity has you get a change perspective on interpersonal relationships for a reason. And, and, you know, there's a reason why Zeus hooked up with chicks but didn't stick around after the kids, you know, they got pregnant and they had kids. Uh, he couldn't have cared less, and there's reasons why. Uh, an attachment is a really horrible, horrible thing to have. Um, so, you know, um, being apathetic and uncaring is some of like the stuff best stuff that Dean's written ever before. Like, you know, seeing these characters do this, um, you know, like I say with Lee, especially Lee really has this disconnect towards the end of the book, uh, from everything that's going on. And he, he has a tenuous lifeline that he finds at the very end. And it, it was kind of like what I was hoping for was going to happen. Um, and again, I can't say if he won or not, uh, but, but, he does end up with the person uh, that I wanted him to end up with. I'll give you that much. But you don't know who that is. You don't. Unless you've listened to me the last couple times I, where I said, I think, uh, you know, here's where Lee needs to be. Um, so, you, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. Excuse me. I want to sneeze here. Um, for him to become disconnected. And, and this, is, this is like... A really brilliant series that doesn't give you an easy ending. Um, if you want happy endings, go to Disneyland. If you want gritty, emotional, and compelling stuff, and wrap it up in a big bow, then look no further. Dean has you covered. Um, but you're not going to get that kind of story in Disneyland. You know, you get the, the, the princess fell asleep and she's kissed awake, and boom, it's, it's true love. Uh, it's not here. It's not here. Um, it's it's real, real uh, the way things occur at the end. Uh, SBT handles the narration. SBT, for those of you in the non know, is Sound Booth Theater. Uh, Jeff Hayes does the bulk of the lifting. Uh, you know, I, I always kid Jeff about being the man of a thousand voices, and, and I've often compared him to being, you know, being like Lon Chaney of the vocal world. Uh, and he kind of compares himself more to being a Muppet. Like, he has, like, uh, I, I know it's self-deprecating, but he'll say, like, oh, I'm just this, I've got this Muppet voice. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm not even going to argue with him about that. You can say he does, you can say he doesn't. Um, but he can pull off voices. Like, you know, his Miller is just the most perfect, perfect, you know, Schwarzenegger riff ever. I mean, like, I, I could ask him to do that character all day long, and if he just, if, if, like, we met and he talked like, like, Miller for two hours, I would never, ever chide him for it, because it is just so brilliant, um, but yet, you know, I have to say that for him having this Muppet voice in his own words, there's no way that you can listen to the last hour of his storytelling and not get an emotional gut punch, uh, on par with a performance from somebody and say a movie like Sophie's Choice, like Meryl Streep style gut punch. 
wham, right in the gut. Um, I mean, it, it is hard. I mean, I'll, I'll equate it to a kick in the nuts. I mean, you, you, everybody can understand the punch in the gut, but not everybody can understand the kick in the nuts. But that's how it feels. It comes across. It's over-freaking-whelming. Overwhelming. Um, it, it just, it, it, it was subdued, and it was nuanced, and it totally, totally blew me away. Uh, you know, so give Jeff credit where it's due, because he really pulled out all the stops on this. Uh, I, and it, it, I finished that book, and it was days after I finished it. It still lingered with me um, from the, the tone and the timber, the tombra of his voice uh, and the way he conveyed things. I really felt bad for, you know, what happens. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying it's a horrible thing. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great story, but it's not something that you say, man, this is, and I'm saying it's in a totally great way, by the way. Um, it's not a, a feel-good book. It, it, it's it's a real book. It's a book with real consequences, real weight to it, and you know, a lot of that is because Jeff manages to convey that with just his voice. Uh, on the flip side, I will say Annie Ellicott also equally turns in and uh, does an emotional turning of the screws. Um, and, and, and she breaks your heart with not just one, but with several different performances. Uh, she's absolutely gut-wrenching, not gut-punching, gut-wrenching, and conveys the heartbreak in mind-numbing sets. Just like here's one time, you know, there's a heartbreak, here's another time there's a heartbreak, as we go from one love interest to another and the various things that happen to everybody at the end of the book. Like I say, um, not everybody makes it. Not everybody gets out unscathed. Not everybody gets out healthily thinking, you know, with, with a healthy healthy mind. Um, and, and Annie really, really, I mean, she, she does this really well. And her system voice at the end is just fantastic. You know, I really do, I, I love hearing Jeff and, and Annie work together because it's just, it's just some of the most brilliant stuff ever. And, you know, you, know, you can say what you want. This, this is really the way I feel about it. I really think this. Um, you know, so the music, the uh, SFX are low key and they're phenomenal here. I, I didn't feel like there was a point where I was overwhelmed by the music. Um, I didn't think that the, the background sound effects were, were out of out of step or out of line. Um, if I had any complaint at all, there was like one point where, where Lee's locked up in something and, and they're talking to him and he's in a box and the muffled stuff. For me, it was a little bit hard to hear because I'm, I'm half deaf anyway, but um, it was a little bit hard to hear, but I just cranked up my volume and I was fine with it. Uh, but it, it was definitely like a sound effect that he was inside of a trunk and he was listening and he, or he couldn't hear whatever it was, and it worked. Um, so, you know, Ahmed Mahmoud is the man here because he's the one responsible for the music and such. So good job, Ahmed. Um, this is probably just some of the best work SBT has done up till now. I mean, this is, there's no probably. I mean, this is, this is clearly the best stuff they've done up to this point. And, and I just wish that there was like other narrators in here with them so that could even uh, praise them as well. Like, you know, Justin Thomas James and uh, Miss Winkle, you know, um, for her part, you know, because they are also a part of this team. Will Watt, I mean, you know, just. I really wish they could all partake in because this is just an incredible experience right here. So Dean kind of deals out portions of perfection and ends the book in a, a manner that we get to see how things pan out for all the survivors. So if they make it to the end of the book, we get to see all the way through their lives up until the point they die. Uh, not, that's not a spoiler because you don't know who who lives, who dies, who doesn't make it, who does make it. And you don't know what happens, but you get that closure, which is really great. I think that, you, you know, for what you're going for, this is good because that way you can say, OK, I know Miller fell into a vat of beer and drowned, but he died happy, you know, or whatever it was that killed him. Uh, that was not what happened, by the way. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's all right there and, and it's very nice and neatly tied up to conclude everything, you know. So I found the ending both very satisfactory, as in there was something that I wanted to have happen that actually happened. Uh, it, but there's also this point where you aren't let off easy. I mean, you are not let go. 
uh, you know, there, there's something about this story that kind of just sticks with you uh, long after you finished it. Like I said, I've read it a couple days ago, and it's still um, hanging in my mind how it ended. Uh, all I can tell you is it's one hell of a way to wrap up a series. Final score, 8.7 stars. I love this book. Well, that's our show. I'm sorry. That's all there is for tonight. Um, I wish I could do more. Still very bogged down, and we do have the things happening in life. Um, but I'm trying to make it where I can do this at least once a week, guaranteed. So I've got several that I'm going to re-record and then put in as a bank. Probably try to stay about two weeks ahead here. I'm not making any promises because my work is extremely crazy right now. Um, and getting things going is just is not possible sometimes for me, especially with the way things are going with my kids and my mother and my, my job, it's just pell-mell. Um, plus, I'm, I'm trying to write on the side to get that done. So uh, <laughs> getting things out back uh, quickly is, is kind of hard to, to, to bank up, but I'm going to do that. But I would like to say thank you all for uh, watching and listening, uh, just maybe keeping an ear open a little bit as I was doing this. I do appreciate you, as always, taking the time to watch or listen. And like I always say, please take a moment and, and leave a review. Um, that's how I got started doing this, it was just leaving reviews for, for books and audiobooks that I liked. And in fact, it was just audiobooks. Um, and I kind of renewed my, my dusty writing skills through creative reviews. Um, and I think it helped me get back into that writing game and that mindset of writing. So, you know, Get out and, and review just just to help out an author, if nothing else. Uh, they always can use the help. They, the, the reviews help, and, and saying something about the book uh, really is appreciated by them. So if you want to support us, you know you can do the same thing for us by you know going to the Lit RPG audiobook Facebook page. We don't have a Facebook page. I'm talking about the Lit RPG Facebook page itself or the YouTube page. Uh, or just share and like this video. And I sincerely hope you've enjoyed our show. Uh, as always, I ask you to please leave a comment or suggestion in the comment section below. Uh, and feel free to tell me what you like. Uh, I enjoy the feedback as well. Okay? Uh, you can always follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Uh, so again, thank you all, and keep listening.